Hello there and welcome. I am Heather Pierce Campbell, the legal website warrior. I'm an attorney and legal coach based here in Seattle, Washington. Welcome to another episode of Guts, Grit, and Great Business. I am super excited to have my friend Adam with me today. So Adam Petticord has joined us and I will introduce Yay. Adam. Yay! We go back. We go but Adam goes back farther yep. than any of my other guests. And so this will be a fun conversation, but Adam and <laughs> I actually went to high school together. <laughs> Um, I, I won't say the time, Adam, because that makes I me feel old. I was just going to say, like, <laughs> <laughs> be careful how far back we want to go here. <laughs> right. I'll just leave it there. Um, but, you know, anybody listening should get to know Adam. I love his mission. And Adam is a dad. He's a customer success executive. He's a combat veteran. I want to ask you a thing or two about that, Adam and founder of Customer Success by Design, a customer retention strategy and, and execution services firm. And Adam, I personally love the name of your business, Customer Success by Design, oh. because Thank I, you. yes, I really think that like it should be the primary focus and often is not. And so the fact that we really need to be intentional about it, I love the by design part, and I, I just think it speaks so well to what you do. Um, to finish your introduction, right? So Adam, his whole focus is really on customer retention consulting, execution services for B2B and B2C SaaS and SMB companies. And what are SMB companies? Uh, small, medium businesses. Got it. I should so, know that, but I just yeah. wanted to clarify. Um, Adam has worked with companies like ADP, Alaska Airlines, and Nordstrom's, just to name a few. And the part that I'm excited to dig into with Adam today so that everybody understands the, um, the power of what Adam teaches on is his focus on creating a win-win-win, a win for the clients and the customers first, right? A win for the businesses and the business owners, but also everybody within the business or related to the business that supports the business's work. Is that right? Is that the way to describe the win-win-win scenario? Yeah. The way I like to think about it, Heather, is that you have a company that is out there with a need. So you as an organization go out to find that, to present your solution, you create a partnership, and then it becomes this okay, we want to make sure we deliver on that so the customer wins, but then you as the business want to make sure that, yes, you stay relevant, vital, and healthy, so you want to win too. I think another component that can get lost in there is the employees themselves. So you got to make sure that you're taking care of everyone along the way and that there's a methodology you can have it done. It's proven, it's tested, and it's a fun puzzle to put together for businesses. So that's what I love to do. No, I love that. And I love that you see it as a fun puzzle. Um, we need people who support our business growth that see those puzzles as fun, because I think sometimes it can be really hard for us to figure all of that out. Um, one additional thing I wanted to mention about Adam is that he's currently serving as the vice president of membership for the American Marketers Association, Puget Sound chapter. So that, I mean, congratulations, first of all, on that, Adam, but sounds like a perfect Thank fit. Thank you. Sounds, sounds like yeah. a perfect fit for you. I'll put it that way. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I can help. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. So let's backtrack a little bit, Adam, because I want to hear about your path leading up to where you are now. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you got there and the things that you've done along the way. Yeah, sure. So as a professional, once I left the service, I kind of took a lay of the land and really didn't know where to go. I think that's an interesting thing that you should think about for another podcast, Heather, is transitioning totally. from there. That'd be a good one. Yeah. Well, um, and let me jump but, in, first of all, and thank you for your service. Sure. I don't know how long oh, you were in the that's service. Sweet. That's sweet. Thank you. Yeah, I was in, I was in uh, for four years. That was, yeah, that was, that was an interesting four years. I yeah. bet. I um, bet. So, um, yeah, so I kind of took a lay of the land. Um, and I saw that a lot of my friends had kind of jumped on the tech bandwagon. And so this was, oh, this was 2005, six. So I was, um, you know, I, I had nothing but my name in a pickup truck. 
Uh, and so we moved back to Seattle after being on the East Coast uh, while I was in the service. And um, I took a job at um, a, a SaaS company, an early, an early dot-com SaaS company called House Values, which provided uh, CRM solutions and essentially leads to real estate mm. professionals. Mm -hmm. And my first job there was just, they called me a coach, which I thought was kind of funny because how was, how was this guy who had just left the military ever going to coach real estate agents, how to essentially like sell. And so, but the role, if you flip it to modern times was really an onboarding specialist and onboarding implementation role. And my goal, my quota was to make sure that customers were getting the maximum value and using the behaviors of the system appropriately. So it gave them the highest likelihood of getting a transaction out of one of the leads. Mm. And that was my first introduction that I had no idea about uh, to uh, what is now called customer success. And from there, you know, I grew rapidly within the organization over a five year period in the leadership roles. And on those ways, I went from this onboarding role to managing a call center, which by the way, anybody out there should, should go out there and do a call center job and then be a call center manager. It's fantastic experience, you know, just getting out there, hitting the phones, talking to people, rapid time, solving problems, rapid. I mean, it was crazy pants. Um, <laughs> I, I one time had to actually, so, in my early career, I actually had created both my legal practice and a photography business at the same time, right? I live mm -hmm. pretty evenly in both sides of my brain. And the funny thing is I actually got called to the east side here in, you know, Seattle. I went to Kirkland because there's a call center there. And apparently they do gangbusters business, but they needed some upper level executives photographed, like their portraits done because they were getting some big press and media attention. And I got to like peek inside the call center and we were also taking kind of some quote unquote action shots, like some live images of the folks working. And it was really fascinating to see like people in their cubicles and um, they all had like, I don't know if it was like rubber ducks. There was something and I don't know if they won those as incentives. I have no idea, but there was so much like decoration and bling in, you know, these cubicles. It was really funny. And then there was this massive table of like candy and red vines. And like, I just remember it being like, oh my gosh, these people are all just hopped up on sugar and living on the phone all day. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny you bring that up because and the reason why I mentioned it to people is I don't think a lot of people realize and hopefully now with COVID and everything and everybody being home, there's a lot of empathy towards those roles because those roles are built not necessarily traditionally out of the need to really service the customer. Historically, they've been built out of the need for operational efficiency, which means that their quotas are typically how long have you spent on the phone with the customer? So the goal is to actually get them off as fast as you can. So mm -hmm. you can take as many calls as you can, and then that you keep the customer happy. So it's really, it's, it's a C-STAT score. So when you go into those environments and you see that traditionally, it's because of the leader in those environments that's, that's like churn and burn stuff. You're getting popped every minute. So you get, there's usually like, um, and there's always a company goal around how long you want the person to wait for someone to pick up the phone. Mm. So as soon as you hang up, they're picking right up. So what you're witnessing there is leadership trying to create an environment that keeps people positive and motivated and happy. And so swag, yes, those, those little duckies that you saw, those are, I guarantee you, they're like some team motivation thing that was going on there. And the candy, I mean, that, I think that's just, I think that's just kind of now table stakes, totally. frankly, for, for what, for what used to be, but uh, who actually that's going to be, an, that, that actually be should be another good guess for you, Heather, someone who's a futurist, who's going to predict the outcomes for what corporate culture is going to be like in the future because we just went through about 20 years of people trying to replicate college uh, a college type environment so people wouldn't want to leave the office yeah and now you can't go to the office anymore so what's that going to look like that's right yeah there's going to be a lot of shifts a lot of shifts yeah so um so I, I grew rapidly through that organization. And then um, after the call center gave within that organization, took a role within the org uh, leading up their renewals team and the retention team. So mm. 
before I hopped over to a MarTech company, I had, uh, by the time I left that company in five years, I had already gone from the customer journey space of onboarding to then support and now to owning the actual outcome of the relationship with the revenue quota that's attached. So, and I kind of stayed on that path throughout my career. The next company was a bootstrap MarTech company that did really, really well, where I was the director of services there. So where I owned the customer outcomes with the managed the team that had that. Uh, then went to a local company called Payscale, where they do a comp benefits analysis, another SaaS play, same role, which was owning customer journey, owning customer outcomes, building and scaling that team. Then went to Oracle, uh, where I got to own the, uh, because I'd never been as a, a big bear of a company before, and I always wanted to figure out what that was like. And that was a real interesting experience because that was actually on the P&L side. So Oracle mm -hmm. treated that group like a consultancy shop. So the quotas there were around um, more like a services type build around uh, deliveries and efficiencies and quality and managing gross margin mm -hmm. there. And then, um, and then the kind of the final step before I launched my entrepreneurial effort was I was the vice president of president of customer success for a cybersecurity company, a small one based out of uh, Bothell, Washington. And I did that for about um, a year and a half. And then I decided, you know what, my personal goal when I got my MBA was at some point to launch my own career, uh, not career, sorry, my own um, company. And I felt at this point in time, you know, I wasn't getting any younger. And there wasn't, there's never a good, it's just like kids. There's never a good time. It's just time. So sometimes you just got to go. So uh, made the family decision that this was, this was as good a time as any to make it go. Now, had I known that there was a pandemic coming. <laughs> <laughs> you might've thought twice about I that one. I would have made the same decision. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> Maybe we wouldn't, we wouldn't have bought a few things, but otherwise, yeah. no, it was fine. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's been my journey, but all along the way, every role I've had has been this wonderful opportunity to be the person where the customer looks at and says, I'm looking to you to make it happen for me, mm -hmm. which I think is a real fun spot to be in because it's totally different than the people who are actually building the product who who think that they're building for what the customer needs versus the seller who establishes the relationship and then is asked to move on. You know, we're working at the back end here of, hey, I'm gonna make this so great for you, so you're never gonna wanna leave. And that's, and that, and then to do that in a way that is profitable to your business, profitable to the customer, and empowering and elevating to your staff, mm -hmm. I think that's where the, that's really where the fun is. Well, it's interesting because I just went through a marketing course with our mutual friend, Mustafa. And yeah, Mustafa. Yeah, it was a good course. Like even for somebody yep. who, and I'm not saying I'm a marketing pro. I've got tons and tons to learn in the world of marketing, but I've been through, I've been around enough to know the basics and still his course was super helpful. And one of the standout things that, that was a really powerful reminder in his course was uh, how poorly most businesses do on nurturing the customer once they have them and customer follow-up and this whole idea of customer retention and how do you convert this initial client relationship into a long-term relationship. People, I don't know if it's just a product of, you know, having so many things to do, people are more concerned with a new lead than they are with nurturing the ones that they already have for the most part. And he ran through some statistic. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what it is, but I love your focus because it seems like there's a massive deficit in the marketplace around this issue. Yeah, I think for me, what the interesting thing is, is that um, there's a lot of data out there that shows that by the, you're going to blink and before you know it, the majority of the revenues that are coming from your business is coming from your actual current cohort, you know? And I think that there's kind of, there's kind of opposing factors at work. You know, those of us in the business community who've gone through, you know, uh, graduate school for business or who've been doing this for a while, 
you know, there's the old adage of you actually, you want to deliver the goods to the customer, yes, with the best experience you can, but frankly, at the least amount of expense to you, it's COGS, right? So what is that? That's an operational efficiency metric. It's like, do it as cheap as you can and as efficient as you can. And there's a place for that, as long as you're delivering the value. The flip side of that is, as your business is scaling and growing, you know, the market's going to do this. Your customer expectations are only going to go like this because they're trying to meet their new goals, their new objectives. And so the dynamic comes in is really around how do you invest in your customers? Where do you invest in your customers? And it's really the customer success methodology and, and philosophy is around you must constantly reinvest in your customers. To Mustafa's teaching to you, it's like the reason businesses are struggling to nurture that relationship is because they keep they struggle with that balance of there's how much do we invest to new market opportunities, new product development, you know, you have to do that. Then you have to do to keep the lights on. But then you also have to do this nurture thing. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. The dynamics that companies deal with is okay, we'll get dialed in in these three areas. We'll get dialed in at getting them the initial value as quickly and expeditiously as possible because that's the first impression. It's the most important impression, you know? So they'll get super dialed in in there, which is the right thing to do. And then they're gonna get super dialed in in two other areas. One is just general support, which is, okay, we gotta make sure that if they call in for help or if they reach out or engage with the product or the service that we're there and we're on the spot, mm -hmm. because that then we're, they're in it, we're in it right there with them. But again, that's a reactive position and then and then the final place where they're going to invest, and this is because it's where the money is, is it's on the renewal side. So they're thinking, okay, when does the contract come up for renewal? How do we make sure we process that? Who does that? But what they miss in that whole narrative is if you're running a subscription-based business and it's a 12-month subscription, let's say your onboarding and time to initial value takes, let's just give them 60 days, mm -hmm. okay? That 60 days, you are highly engaged, you get to initial value, you're trained, you're happy, and then you're kind of gone, right? And then let's say the renewal contract piece comes up and businesses all do the same thing, which is, hey, 90 days before, we wanna make sure we get ahead of it, so we're gonna reach out to you 90 days before, but then what are you gonna say? Like if you're the person doing that renewal and you haven't been checking in all along or you haven't been adding or increasing value all along, what are you gonna say? Are you happy? Great, fantastic. Are you good? Great, yeah, fantastic. And the thing where businesses are falling down there as well too is if you're gonna just take that approach, you might as well just automate it. Right. Take the whole human component out. So then you've got, just by that math, so we said 60 days, 90 days, how many days does that leave them in the middle to where you're there for them, but you're there in this reactive manner. Hmm. It's all really about playing offense. It's about putting on the mentality and doing the diligence with the customer base and your own internal operational efficiencies and design about how can we go play offense in a way that scales. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. I, I think that we all have massive opportunities to rethink our, our whole system, front to back, how we communicate, how we play offense instead of defense. And early on, I went through some training with a company called Six Division, and they're automation. They're, they live in the Infusionsoft land and implementing, you know, your... Um, all of the automation for your customer experience and your email communications and CRM and all of that. And I remember going to their training and first of all, like from square one, you're dropped into a system that is all about like helping you set expectations, right? But when I think of a company yeah. that does this well, it's like, here's your introductory email and attached to that is a video that you click on and says, when you come for this experience, here's what our bu building looks like, right? And he's out front, like literally walking, like, like replicating. And I think the goal in the online world, I could be wrong, but I know that for me, like even my history as a photographer, my goal through portraiture and especially people who were, you know, putting up branding photos or, you know, entrepreneurs that are creating an online website, the goal is that you replicate as much a, as possible the in-person experience with you, you know, through your website, through the online experience. And 
you can't, you know, you can't always make that a perfect experience, but there all are ways that you can elevate that experience. And so getting back to this other example of like, here's our building. He walks you literally through this video of here's what you're going to do when you get here and X, Y, and Z, but they, they lay it out so that your expectations are crystal clear about what is about to happen. Right. And then sure enough, you show up and there it is. You have no problem finding the building. You go inside, you go up the stairs and, you know, before you even go into the workshop, it's like, oh, hi, he you know, they've got their list out. Hi, Heather, blah, blah, blah. What do you want for lunch today? Here's the options. And like they're setting you up for all of these ways that they're going to serve you that day and not treat you like a number, right? Not just have the same experience for everybody, even though they have really automated it. They're, they're treating you as an individual. And I just remember repeatedly throughout that experience being like, oh, this is the way that it's done. Even when you combine automation with a service experience or a workshop experience or whatever, there really are ways to elevate that. And to this day, they're one of my favorite companies just based on you know, the single experience I had with one of their offerings. You know, what's so funny about your story there is really it's that company did a great job of laying the foundation of building a long lasting relationship with you. You know, you mentioned expectations a lot. Why is that important? Well, because you want to know what you're getting into as you go through that. You know, they made, they took the effort, they made the investment to give you the experience of what you should expect. Let's give you a tour of the building you're gonna walk into. Let me photograph or film it with this person who you're going to meet. And then once you get there, they follow through. You know, it's not like a, whoops, we missed this thing. They took the time to lay a roadmap or to design, mm -hmm. you know, in air quotes, a whole customer journey aligned to you and your expectations. And the other interesting thing that you talked about there was, you know, the level of experience and did not have it be cookie cutter. They made you feel like an individual. That is the art of designing customer success at scale. You know, there's that old adage of, um, you know, in my profession, people generally break it down into three tiers. You know, there's tier A, which is kind of your tech touch group, which is we, based upon the level of scale that you want to invest with us and that we're able to invest back to you, you know, we feel you'll be just as successful as you need to be with the product and service just by going through these automated programs and things. You don't really need to hear for us, but if you want to talk to us, we're here for you. And occasionally we'll reach out. Then you kind of have kind of your um, your middle group, right? Which is kind of your bread and butter. They're like your, your sweet spot. They are where you're kind of doing this dance. Uh, they get some automated love, but then they're also hearing from you. You know, you're actually picking up the phone and calling them back in the day, which hopefully it'll come back around again. They actually would come on site and see you. They would shake hands. If you really, you knew you were in good with them, if they gave you a hug. Mm -hmm. So who knows? I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we'll get back to hugs one day. Right. But um, yeah. And then and then you might hear about what you call the white glove service, which is that concierge service, which is, hey, you are you are acknowledging that you want this type of level and you're paying for it. So we are going to give it to you and then some. And that is that very much that handheld. We are going to guide you all the way through. So from as you're talking about it, it's funny to, for me to hear that because I think that company did a great job because at some point you fall, Heather, we all fall with every cust with every company that we send a check to, we all fall into one of those three tiers. And the fact that that company made you feel like an individual, that is success. That is the relationship that you want to have established regardless of what tier they fall into. Mm -hmm. That's the art and the science behind it is the fun puzzle pieces that uh, we were talking about earlier. No, that's right. And the thing I know to be true is they probably have run thousands of customers through that process. Same thing, same workshop, same training, and yet like they stick in my mind as somebody who really did it right. And, you know, let's be clear, they run a small business. I mean, they're a machine, but they probably have, if I were to guess, 15 or 20, you know, employees, people working in that business. and 
even once I was complete with the service, even once I had gone through everything and, you know, whether or not they had more to sell me or not, I don't know. But there was a period of time where, you know, I remember repeatedly receiving things from them in the mail. So for example, I, I had had a baby girl maybe a year or two after I worked with them, but they somehow knew enough to keep in touch. And I don't know if they pulled it off of my social media profile, something. Suddenly I got a note in the mail. I almost, I had a near death experience <laughs> preceding my baby girl. I got a card from them around the near death and flowers. And then when I had my baby girl, I got another card and a onesie with their company logo on it. Wow. Right. But I was like, who are these people? And that's the level of like paying attention to their clients and their marketplace. Like well after I had completed their service, I was still having this very high touch experience, which is why I rave about them. Right. And like I hold myself to like, how can I build that level of business where everybody feels that taken care of? Yeah. You know, what's fascinating to hear that story about the the 800 pound gorilla in our marketplace today is Amazon. And one of the reasons that people always like latching on to Amazon and they get, I think, justifiably so a lot of credit for this is they have this term that they like to call customer obsession. You know, you are you you over geek out on your customers. You do your homework and you remember and you take action mm -hmm. through these things. So obviously they are obsessed with you and they did their homework on you and they took action around that. And I think that's why one of the things that I preach and bring to the market is around, you've got to be centered on the customer. It's all about this customer centricity. You know, it's this mentality of, Heather is now here with us. She's with us. And we are going to take care of Heather throughout thick and thin. And we're always going to be there for her. It doesn't even necessarily mean she needs to be in the building or even right now actively engaging with us. We're still going to be there for Heather. We're going to reach out to Heather with stuff that matters to Heather because we know Heather, because we listen to Heather while she was here and we observed Heather while she was here and we're always going to make sure that she lets, uh, she knows that we care. Mm -hmm. Well, and I love, I mean, first of all, we all need people like you to be helping us map this process for our customers. How do you, how do you go about doing that? I mean, I assume that this could look very different business to business, right? So talk to us a little bit about how you walk your clients through this journey. That's a great question, you know, and again, it kind of all starts with the customer and what problems they are expecting you to solve. So that's the first layer. And then the interesting layer that I think comes after that is you need to talk to the staff who's responsible for delivering that. I think mm -hmm. uh, what I've observed happening is companies are, I, are missing one of those two components. They're either talking to the customers, but then they never talk to their own internal staff who's responsible for delivering it, which just creates chaos for the staff, or they just talk internally to the staff and they never talk to the customers and they end up building something that they think the customer needs. And the customer goes, why did you waste your time on this? I had a bad day and I griped about it once, but that's not the bigger problem. Mm. So, so phase one is just start there and any company can do that. Talk to your customers, just ask them, you know, Hey, take me through your experience with us. You know, start with just, why did you choose us? You know, and then walk me through, here's the milestones that we've had along the way. Talk to me about how this went through and then what you thought your goals were each step of the way and then how we did very open-ended. Mm -hmm. Just keep it and just listen, just listen and write it down or record it now better, even more so. And then repeat the process with your team. But the interesting step with your team is then you get to dive into how you're actually going about delivering it. And then you just do what you would normally do. You do a process map. You do a process map of what are the customers saying? What does that flow look like through their eyes? What's the operational journey look like for us? And then you link in the points of friction along the way. And then the final component that you have to ask yourself is, okay, 
there are the financials that get attached to it. You know, so you do those three layers and then you step back and you ask yourself, okay, number one, is any of this acceptable to us? Number two, is any of it acceptable to the customers? Okay, and then number three, all right, what are we gonna go tackle? Because the interesting thing is that, and this is where it's okay for businesses to acknowledge, they have to have a reality check on where they're at. You know, it's, um, I, I had a great conversation the other day on uh, my live stream, and we really spent a good chunk of time on like this, where do we invest conversation? And I think that's, that becomes the hard part for companies, especially at the exec level. And that's why you have to do these deep dives into data and you can't, you can't just go with um, the usage data, you know, or the usage message. You have to get out there and talk to people because you're trying to bring the empathy into the room at those levels so they can sit back and go, okay, yes, we realize if we invest in customer success over here, that means we don't get to invest in this over here for sales, marketing, IT, whatever product, but it's the right thing to do because it will eliminate A, B, and C for our customers, which will mean they'll be happier, they'll be healthier, they will stick with us longer, which is again, at this stage of the game, where the majority of the revenue is coming from for your business. That's right. Well, and you, you mentioned in there, like looking at the process, designing what you think it could look like, identifying points of friction. Give us some examples of what the points of friction look like. So I think that there, a classic case in a SaaS company is just in, going back to integrations and onboarding. You know, we're, there's still a lot of companies out there where you have to just, you have to align the data. You just, you, it, it's not as easy as a lot of the B2C uh, great uh, tools that are out there where you can just start from scratch, you plug it and you're working within their data mart. You're really like spending initial time mapping. It's really just data mapping at the end. So that can take time. And any way that you can chip away at that on that integration speed is a huge value because what happens in those instances is, you know, companies do their best, but most customers probably don't know their own internal data challenges and data marts well enough to be able to articulate it to the vendor. And then the vendor stepping in, and if they haven't done the diligence up front and saying, here's how our format works, here's how you have to expect things to do if they don't get ahead of it, then they start this conversation, it can blow your implementation timeline out months if you're not careful. So you have to you have to help your customers through understanding their own data mark first, and you have a command of what are the core data points they need to have in that initial phase. And everybody needs to know that it doesn't have to be the full swath. There's a lot of great tools out there that you can do tons of data integrations with, but that might not be what the customer needs to get quickly. So have plans in places to where just get them to initial value first. And if you need to then roll out to the next phase, great. But again, you got to get ahead of it. You got to talk to your customers ahead of time to say, we'll phase you in, or you can choose to do it all in one swap. But here's the timelines that we're looking at. This is what you're accountable to and we need you to hit. This is what we're accountable to and we will hit. Hmm. So that's typically a friction point. Um, another friction point, frankly, for early stage fast growth businesses, they just, they just can't keep up with the volume. So things just slip, you know, they don't quite have the tracking tools yet in place to make sure that, um, Hey, there's a ticket in here that's been around for what, five days. Has anybody responded or things that, Hey, they're, they're sitting in people's inboxes. Yes, we all make mistakes, but are, are you going to go back and get to that? Or um, like we talked earlier around just, we never hear from you. You know, this right now, every brand and company is being monitored heavily for what they're saying and what they're doing. And I think what you've seen is a lot of brands came out and came out a little flat with the COVID-19 responses because, you know, yes, we've did, done business before, but I never heard from you before. 
unless you wanted to sell me something. And not even to like your point, like just send me like a happy birthday if you have my birthday in your database or send me an anniversary note of the first time that we met, you know, something like that. And all of a sudden you, you come to my doorstep proclaiming your, you're wearing, you've got your cape on and everything. Great. You're here. It's kind of like a little bit too late. Mm -hmm. So I think, and now, especially with the, the social justice movements that are going out there and a lot of companies making some pretty bold statements, a lot of them are getting, are getting called out because if you look at how many of them have signed up to publicly proclaim their diversity record. They don't have to proclaim it. Only, let's see, Intel does it. Who else does it? There was one other I forget. But, you know, accountability is huge. So as you think about these things, you know, everybody right now is getting measured, not just on what you say, but it's the, it's the walk, the walk. Great. You talk, walk the walk. That's right. And I think, yes, I think a lot of businesses are learning some hard lessons right now in the midst of COVID. Um, I mean, both around messaging, around like where were they before COVID, right? And it's, it's really interesting to watch companies that have been responsive or being responsive and those that aren't. But I think it does just underline, whether it's crisis mode or not, it underlines the importance of regular contact of, you know, however you're nurturing your clients to have a plan so that you don't find yourself stuck in a weird spot of suddenly needing to show up and not having been communicating with them. And I, yeah. I, I think to your friction points for the folks that I serve, most of them are going to fall into the second spot being overwhelmed, not like just not staying yeah. on top of it and having a way to have, you know, covered things or mapped it from the beginning. And so they're playing catch up. They're trying to fill in the gaps and do things after the fact because of the way that they're growing. Right. So um, I think most people that, and probably most that are listening to this podcast are in that zone of like needing to create systems on the fly and do this as they grow and develop and finding that to be a challenge. Yeah. I, and, and to that group, I would say it's okay. You're not alone. Um, but that's actually where tech can help and should be your savior because it is tough, um, you know, if you're lean and mean, but that doesn't mean that you can't create automated systems of love and you can't work on thinking dynamically. Like your example around the letter that you got, that's great. There are companies out there for a very reasonable fee that will even do thank you letters for you, like mail thank you letters. You know, it, um, you know, e email's always good. You can never go wrong with email. Um, and social just opens up a whole new world. I mean, just the fact that, you know, you and I are both doing podcasts now. I've got my, I've got my live stream going. The, the, the entry to barrier to these things really, yes, there's a, there's an investment, but it's not that much. And it's really about how far are you willing to go and how disciplined can you be? And it can just be something as simple as create a community, community Facebook page. You know, um, a lot of, I think people do that really well. Um, there are other channels where you can bring people together. You can just, you can host like social webinars and events right now, lunch and learns, um, you, it really, you can find ways to create events that will draw your customers into you by gifting them something of just, and that in itself is creating value to them. Even something as simple as every month, I'll be hosting this, this gathering of my, for my community. Everybody join and we'll just check in, Q and A will all get better. Something as simple as that. And that's scalable because that's maybe one month commitment. Let's say, let's say two, two, eight hour days to put it together. Mm -hmm. That's, that's scalable. Totally. Well, and I, I like even just your examples of breaking down simple ways that people can nurture. Cause I think often people feel overwhelmed by the process of even 
mapping what they think they should do or trying to dig into that. And I was having a conversation with a friend the other day who he just wants to get this one simple thing off the ground, right? He's kind of headed in a new direction in his business and he's like, I don't even have a landing page. I don't have a way to enroll people, but I have people that are ready to enroll. And I was like, you don't need a landing page. You don't need an online payment form. Like, and I, I said this, create a Facebook group. If they're on Facebook, you know, have, have a way that you can communicate with everybody at the same time, but you don't have to have all this backend technology if you're ready to do something right now, which he was. And he was like, oh, hadn't even thought of that. But I think we also need to be creative around like, how we can, you know, how we can engage in progress over perfection to begin nurturing people and supporting people right now while we figure out what the rest of our system might look like. I totally agree. And I think the, the, the mentality that I would have people take is it's okay to let your customers know this is my, we're, we're giving this a go. You know, I've never done this before. You know, like what, uh, a very real example for myself was, you know, when I started my live stream, I was like, I feel terribly uncomfortable doing things like this, but hey, here we go, you know? So it's just level with people. I think more than anything right now, everybody is looking for that level of intimacy with whomever they work with. And because we're all, we're all going through and have been through quite a bit uh, recently, I think businesses are waking up to seeing that people are expecting a level of social accountability and social etiquette that goes along with it, but they're also being very forgiving, mm-hmm. you know, so just, I think what people are asking for really is just um, authenticity. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's okay. You know, I think just hit on what you're supposed to hit on to help the customer grow. And then from the nurturing component, be you be bold, um, be quick, and measure, obviously, to make sure it's effective for both parties. And if it isn't, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Sunset it and move on and keep trying. Mm-hmm. No, I, I love the, I mean, especially the authenticity piece. I think people often feel like they have to have already achieved the great thing or designed the perfect process or whatever. And I so appreciate, and I've been through a couple of these recently where, you know, I think one of the greatest traits that can serve us as we build our businesses is humility, right? Which, which overlaps with authenticity yeah. about saying, hey guys, here's what I'm at. And I, even at the end of Mustafa's course, one thing that I love that he did where I was like, man, that took real guts to do that in the, like the very end of this delivery of what was a fantastic week long course, but he literally saved the last 10 or 15 minutes for himself and just said, look, I want you guys to be brutally honest. How did I do? Where did I fall down? He, and he'd given a pitch partway through so that people had the option to enroll in the next thing if they wanted support actually implementing the marketing plan that he'd helped them design. And he was like, what didn't work about that? Like, if you didn't sign up, tell me why. I want to know so that I can figure it out and do better the next time. But he was just so open and honest. And I loved that. I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, building that feedback loop into our systems is critical. And I think it's hard to do. I think, I think, you know, trying to figure out how to do it in a way that will allow people to open up and give honest feedback and to be willing to receive it really, it really does take some guts. It does. And, and the thing that um, I would say too, is it, it can take people a while to get there and that's okay. You know, part of the interesting component of being in customer success is, you know, I would typically own, we would typically own the surveys and the feedback that would come in. And the, the surveys were typically always directed at experiences that, my staff or my customer staff were the front lines on and you get into this job because you want to help people win you want people to grow and when they come at, and they come at you and stuff happens to everyone but you get that negative when you're just like you know and then you're sitting there you've got your manager over here and their job is to help grow you and develop you and I would find that most of the time is just spent on helping people understand that feedback is good. Learning how to take it is the trick. 
You know, you have, you have to find that internal confidence almost to understand this is what I can command and control. And this is what's kind of out of my sphere. And yes, I own this component and I accept my ownership of this component. And I accept that these are things that I might be able to influence, but you know, I can't. And I think that's the mental space you have to be able to help people get to in order for them to get to that just bold outcome that I think it's great to hear Mustafa do it because I think you know the deal. Any entrepreneur just has to be that direct. Like, tell me if I suck. You know, it's not like, you know, it's not like, it's not like, every, yes, we're all great unicorns in our own mind, but really, like, I need to get better. It's you're addicted to getting better. You understand that perfection is always the goal, but it's never quite attained. So you keep hitting it. You want that constant feedback loop. And I think that for me, that just kind of goes back into that cultural component. How do you get that into part of the DNA of you as an organization and then down to the employee level? Cause they're the ones who are going to be transmitting that out. And then you at the leadership level, being able to absorb that back in from the customer. So then you take action. The other interesting thing is like you, you then have to decide what you're going to take action to. You do have to decide, okay, who is speaking a language that makes sense? And then you have to do something with it and then tell them that you did something with it. You know, close the loop with them. Don't just let it like hang out there. Like, Hey, we did this thing. Say, Heather, I heard you. You are awesome. Thank you. Keep speaking up. Here we go. Or better yet involve that person who's giving you the feedback in part of the solve. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that it's a wonderful opportunity for people who are invested in certain products and certain companies to get them even deeper into the relationship and help them feel even more valued by helping them be part of the process of making your company better for their benefit. Well, and how do you help clients filter out the feedback that essentially should be ignored from that which should really change their company culture or their approach to things, right? Their systems, maybe. So I think for me, it kind of comes down to a couple of components. You really have to be dialed in and listening to what the customer market is saying. Everybody's going to have that customer or two whose value is so important to the business. It's kind of like the suck it up and do it. Mm -hmm. You just, you just, you find a way to make it happen. Okay. But you do have to understand your market as you're making your strategic investments as far as what customers are saying to you. And I, and it kind of goes back to almost a, a mathematical equation, which is, okay, who's saying what categorize it, try and condense it into really like detailed, not well, just kind of summarized components that you can stack rank. You do have to provide a monetary value of outcomes for your customers and for your company. You do have to look at that and you have to look at the ROI analysis. You do. And I think this is the hard test of any great business. It's okay. Which are the investments that we hear from customers they want to make and which are the ones that we're going to say no to. And I think that's the hardest thing to do because if you're in my seat in my role, you want to give everything you can to everybody. You, you just, you want them to win. You're going to get them there. You're going to make them happy. They're going to love you. And we're going to love each other. It's going to be, everybody's going to dance off over the hills in the sunset. Right. But, but, but that's really not reality. We have to make tough decisions and it's almost like you put on a little bit of the product manager's hat which is where you have to learn how to say no. You have to learn how to triage and say no. And then as you articulate that back out to your customer community, you have to give them an explanation and a continual solve, which is, okay, we've, we've made the decision that we're not going to invest in that in this time. However, I have found these other things that I believe can work for you that I recommend that you explore. Because I think where businesses can fall short is they try to solve everything when instead they should be solving what they really are trying to solve for, for the customers. Yeah. And is that really a values based conversation around like what the company values as an outcome? I mean, how, how do companies get clarity around 
you know, I'm still trying to figure out, especially for somebody that is a smaller business that doesn't have the the ability maybe to engage in as in-depth analysis is probably what you do for companies that are either growing quickly or have the budget to do this kind of work. Like how, how you value one type of feedback over another um, as you're sorting your way through this path of um, figuring out what matters as a business and to your clients and trying to figure out that overlap. Oops, it sounds like I lost your audio. Hmm. Accidentally hit mute. You there? Um. Oh, did you come back? No, I think I heard you hit mute again, maybe. Let me see. Let me unmute you here. Are you there? Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that. Suddenly, I know, suddenly audio just went away. It's all right. We can cut this chunk out. Give me one second. I'm just going to check on my little squealing baby girl. Did I get you back? You're back. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Oh, oh I wonder if uh, I wonder if there's a time limit. My phone oh. said that we were on, I was on the call for an hour, so maybe that it just automatically maybe so. kicks me off. <laughs> maybe yes, because we chatted Sorry for about a while that. first. No, 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 no big deal. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, anyways, I was so just your trying. Question? Yeah, I was just yeah, trying to so figure out how, how a smaller business, like a, you know, a smaller so, team would figure out how to prioritize this stuff. So, so here's my recommendation to any smaller team. Um, and I'll just, I'll strike it from a brass tax, just straight business perspective. Go to your customer revenue sheet. Sort it by mm -hmm. who's paying you the most versus who's paying you the least. Okay? Just look at the top quartile. All right, top 25% and just go, okay. And just go through them and go, are these companies that align still with where I, where I vision for this product to go or where, where, why I'm here in the first place, mm -hmm. you know, and then talk to them, go talk to them, keep it simple. And then sprinkle in others through the rest of your list. Mm. So think of the easy, the easy for it is just, uh, if you've got, let's say you have a hundred clients, go talk to 25, mm -hmm. just go talk to 25, ask them the same questions. Your questions should be entirely open ended, but they should be targeted enough that you'll glean the data that you want out of them. And then just, and then go back. And then just kind of summarize it and, and look. And I think that's where you'll find a couple of things. You'll find, how are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know, you'll find, um, where's the market going? And am I still aligned with that? And you'll find if, if this is actually the customer profile I should be going for. I think being able to distinguish, and I like the simplicity of that for a smaller business, just looking at where your revenue is coming from, going to the top whatever percentage, makes a lot of sense because I feel like a lot of folks in the world that I serve, they're going to get some of their, their biggest and most repetitive complaints from people that they actually shouldn't be working with. Yeah, it's, we live in this world where because of the channels, you know, people have people have a way to raise their voice at a level that can be distracting rather than empowering and informative. You want it, you want to try and weed through that as best you can. Um, it's I'm not saying turn a blind eye to those who are 
training, but you have, you have to wait it. You know, you have to wait that I'm going to spend the majority of my time looking at this. Yes, I will always establish a cadence and make sure that everybody's getting the attention that they deserve and that I am setting as this is my brand for the experience that I'm going to give everyone. But yeah, you can't, you can't be everyone to everything. If you try to be, you're going to fail. Right. Well, and I just have found that there are, um, and I mean, obviously everybody should be aspiring to create a business model and systems within their business that really support the ideal experience, support their ideal customer. And yet I still find that even businesses who are doing that well, you take their, the 10% of essentially their lowest paying clients that will make the majority of the noise, right? And so yep. that's where, you know, sometimes it's just an issue of like who you're working with and being able to filter out some of the complaints that really are not relevant to the bulk of who you serve. But I find that some people try to respond to those and change their model in a way that really doesn't need to be changed across the board if 90% of their clients are having the kind of experience they want. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the one cautionary tale I would advise anyone with that is as you're looking at that 10%, make sure that that 10% isn't going to be your 90% mm. in like the, the three to five years, because, you know, I think, I think a lot of businesses are able to hit that growth and that scale because they're able to land those couple of first really big fish that allow them to reinvest. And then they focus a lot of time, continue to head up market. And then they find that they actually maybe cap out mm. faster than they expected. And they have a lot of um, numbers that are below that where maybe they're not spending as much attention to. So you just got to be mindful and keep an eye on that is all I'm saying, because you got to, you may find hidden gold down there mm. if you're not careful. Well, that's a really good point. Yeah, that's an excellent point is thinking about also the longevity of any client and also their, their progress. Okay, this is what happened, but I think she never went to sleep. I heard talking, 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 talking. Um, but I like that. I mean, really considering, you know, because for example, in my business, I really have two levels of clients. I've got ones that will hire me in the earlier part of their journey. Um, and then I, I end up working with clients later on in their journey, but it's actually, it's actually the same client, right? It's just that mm -hmm. the consistency is that they are, uh, I mean, the consistent theme for my clients are that they're serious about their business. They just intersect with me at different points in their journey. Well, I think that is such a self-aware thing for you to say. I think that's great because I think you can, I've seen a lot of businesses over index on why aren't they, why aren't they engaging with us now? Why aren't they doing this? Well, if, if you're a provider of, you know, if you're, if your solution provides, you know, tax information or like taxes, you know, a lot of people think that's just a, that's a once in a year thing. You, you have, you have to understand a little bit of the, the general life cycle of what's going on there. Um, for your business, you know, like, uh, for example, when I was at the cybersecurity company, you know, people only thought about it when either they were hacked or which is after the fact, which is what you don't want to have, or if they were needing to do something to maintain compliance with a government regulation, which was typically annually done or every other year done, depending upon the size and scale of the business. So how do you provide an experience that continues to remind them to do the right things all along the way or else you're going to get sloppy and something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where you can kind of come in with those uh, experiences. So let's call it just experiences of scale where you're providing value. You're always there. You can go above and beyond if you so choose, but it, um, it still keeps you there in front of their face. Yeah. No, I think it's just um, the importance of the client nurture experience just cannot be overstated. I mean, from, from so many angles, like I, people forgetting that the clients they already have is the future lifeblood of their business. Yeah. And I think especially for your, for your listeners and audience, Heather, I, I understand that with the lean teams, you know, you're kind of focused mainly on 
got to get new business. Everybody's got to eat. And then you got to deliver to those who you have. And then you got to go back and get new business because then, yeah. And then you've got this. And I think that's where if I were to coach anybody who's got a smaller business and they're very lean, even if they're a solopreneur, I think it's really important to just, just make an early call on what you want to have for a CRM system Mm -hmm. because that will allow you the freedom to start tying in to these other experiences that we've talked about, whether they be email, social, whatever, it gives you the database to work from. If you do that, then you can just start building all the other things. So then it's just, you're there. Like my, I, I hired a plumber a couple of weeks ago to help uh, fix our bathtub that was leaking. And they have a great, they have a great automated email marketing cadence. You know, I, I went into the database. It's great. You know, it's, it's a plumber, you know, so there, there's stuff out there that exists that you can do. Um, so if I were to coach anybody who's living in that world, I would say just don't, don't take too long, do your research and just pick a CRM system give yourself a week, pick it, and either hire a virtual assistant or suck it up and do it yourself, get your data in there, and then let that thing, and then be disciplined about using it and grow from there. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's great advice. Another friend of mine in, um, in the business, he calls it pick and stick. He's like, I really don't care what you pick. Make sure that it, for the most part, meets your needs, although also understand there's no one perfect solution out there. But pick yeah. and stick and use the tool that you have and just learn to use it well. So I think it's really, really good advice. Um, so Adam, where can people, for anybody that wants to follow up and learn more either about how they do this better in their own business, maybe they have a referral for you, what is the best way for them to get in touch? Yeah, you can either just hit me up on my website. There's an easy registration page. Just get a hold of me on uh, csbydesign.com. Or you can just shoot me an email at um, info at csbydesign.com. Awesome. And I will share your links and your contact information on my show notes. So for anybody listening, make sure you visit legalwebsitewarrior.com forward slash podcast for the show notes to Adam's episode. Adam, what? any final thoughts for the listeners? Anything that you want to leave off with? Leave off with. We got this. Yes, that's a good one. We got this. And, um, you know, we, we're all in it. There's no escaping it for any one of us. But I think that um, for me, what I find really, really helps is connection, listening to stories that other people are willing to share about how they're making their way through, right? It's all really important, especially right now. And the other thing I'm encouraging people to do is if they do find that they're in a bit of a lull, or they have slowed down a little bit during this time to, to not waste it, to use it to improve upon systems like what you're talking about, right? Really building on business fundamentals. So that, um, I think, is a huge opportunity for a lot of us. I, I agree. And I would also encourage people to, this is a wonderful opportunity to just be bold and experiment. You know, it's, it's, it's a great time to just try. I love that. Yep. I love that. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate you hanging out with me today and talking about your expertise and sharing it with people. So um, if you're listening, get in touch with Adam and make sure that you have got your own system in place for your own customer journey and customer success by design built into your business. All right. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Heather. It's great seeing you again. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.